Don't let politicians have all the fun. Each month, the North American Debate Circuit is running an online, highly competitive tournament at a low cost for everyone to join. Next month, we have the Garnet Cup on January 21st. If it's your first time, send us the code YouTube and we'll take 25% off your entry fees. Hope you enjoy the round. Ishan and I affirm, our sole argument concerns global hotspots. Subpoint A is a South Asian scuffle. Gongulio 2 explains simply, since their genesis, India and Pakistan have been locked in an endless spiral of hostility. Khan furthers the deeply traditional and religious societies of the two countries undermines political negotiation. Thus, only outside mediation can get around their inherent biases. Tufts University finds, thankfully, the U.S. can encourage diplomacy between India and Pakistan to resolve conflicts. Great power competition is the method by which this will happen. Hassan 22 observes GPC forces the U.S. to embrace India as a bulwark against China, which requires the U.S. to reduce Indo-Pak tensions, fostering stability and peace for Pakistan, and preventing it from siding with Beijing. Indeed, plans are in motion right now as State 22 quantifies U.S. investment in Pakistan has increased by 50% in recent years. Preventing further Chinese influence in Pakistan is crucial, as Rubin 22 warns Chinese producers eat up Pakistani revenue, with the World Bank warning Pakistan could soon face instability and societal breakdown. A collapse would be devastating. Ackerman 21 cooperates Pakistan's military carts or nuclear weapons around in civilian vehicles without defenses, drastically increasing the probability that terrorists will acquire them. Thus, Wing 19 concludes India and Pakistan is the most likely break place where a major nuclear war could break out in the wake of a deadly terrorist attack. Subpoint B concerns nuclear spending. W.J. Henningen of Time Magazine reports in October, the Biden administration's new defense strategy puts the U.S. on Cold War footing with China and Russia, with plans to build weaponry and a top-to-bottom expensive overhaul of the American nuclear arsenal. This strategy works. Lothar 16 argues the destructive power of our nuclear weapons makes starting a war or escalating one far too risky. In fact, absent our existing strategy, we'd resort to more violent alternatives. Garrison 09 warrants a reduction in the role nuclear weapons play in America's strategy requires a corresponding increase in conventional capabilities. That would be terrible. Glacier 17 warns forward deployment of our military antagonizes otherwise peaceful allies, causes aggression in adversaries, and militarizes disputes. In fact, a 2018 RAND study found an increase in U.S. troops is associated with more than double the risk of war or the use of force initiated by an adversary state. Subpoint C is African assistance. Before U.S. GPC, China's influence in Africa was staggering. Chaudhuri 21 writes China's total loans to Africa from 2000 to 2018 totaled $148 billion. Unfortunately, TRT 19 explains Beijing is laying debt traps, seizing the assets of countries that are unable to clear their debts. Great power competition forces the U.S. to extend its own help to the developing world. Cohen 22 argues specifically to counter China, the U.S. has unveiled a new strategy in order to forge closer relationships with sub-Saharan Africa, including tackling global food insecurity, terrorism, and setbacks to democracy. Our COVID 20 confirms the extent of our new influence, writing that American direct investment was nearly $31 billion in mere years, responsible for the creation of 62,000 jobs. Thankfully, the Global Fund confirms just $18 billion of that would save 20 million lives, cut HIV and malaria death by 64%, and strengthen overall health systems all across the continent. Subpoint D is Latin American liberalism. Before the GPC, Isaacson 21 warns China and Russia have exercised influence through propaganda and misinformation in Latin America, which is why Berg of CSIS and 22 explains democracy promotion is imperative in the U.S.'s great power competition with China and Latin America and is intimately linked to the region's domestic health. Democracy going global promotes peace, as Lynn Jones of the Belfer Center writes, if the number of democracies continues to grow, the number of co conflicts that escalate into war will diminish. That's key. Dowd finalizes the next great power war will involve nuclear weapons that could end civilization, but thankfully, by preventing democracy from declining, we solve that problem. In order to save lives and promote peace across the board, Ishan and I are proud to affirm, and we urge you to do so as well. Thank you. We need a contention one is Middle East, ma'am. Edelman 19. Greater power competition suggests the U.S. has taken a risk in the Middle East as it relaunches its effort on Europe and Asia. Withdrawal will create a vacuum filled by Iran, a threat to Israel's security. GB21. Iran is more emboldened, rests are restrained by American military power. Despite the fiasco, Biden's regional drawdown continues. Fearful Israel and powerful Iran makes devastating war imminent. Jones 22. Unlike 81 and 07, Israel faces a more difficult security predicament. A proxy drop on Israel like a snake. Lebanon, Hezbollah, and Gaza's Hamas. Jerusalem with no longer content to mow the grass and strategically limit strikes, but is preparing to get rid of the entire yard. The worst war the Middle East has seen. I can be 11. 
129 confirms Netanyahu on his return to power could order an attack on Iran if the U.S. can't take action. Talks of plans of re- is reaffirmation. Israel has prepared capabilities for a strike. In the event of conflict, Avery 20, Russia, China might be drawn and nuclear weapons would be used intentionally or by accident. Global famine would result. It would destroy civilization. Contention 2 is democratic dominoes. Democracy is in free fall. Walsh 21, the world is in a long democratic career session with democracy worsening 73 countries, specifically official 21. The U.S. and its allies count for only 5% of worldwide increase in democracy with a staggering 36% of the backsliding. Our strategy is at fault. Greens 22, competition compels the U.S. to make undemocratic compromises. An anti-China, anti-Russia agenda justifies backing despotic leaders from Turkey to Saudi Arabia to the Philippines and beyond. The U.S.'s influence could be much better spent. Great power rivalry will validate the Russian China spats and lead to the election of autocratic leaders who decry the U.S. GPC prevents productive solutions. Cranny 20, the U.S. has other potential partners, NATO, Japan, South Korea, and Australia, could all be better harnessed to counter autocratic powers rather than pursue alliances with shifty dictators. Washington should mobilize existing partnerships. Democratic allies enjoy the power need to excel in GPC. Democracies and impact felt to Kaspar 17. The existential threat is real terrorist movements, extremist parties, nuclear blackmail. Democracy is the only proven remedy for nearly every crisis, war, famine, peril, poverty, terror, are all generated by authoritarian regimes. Contention 3 is the association of Southeast, Southeast Asian nations. Louis 21, since the Cold War, ASEAN is taking great pains to avoid taking sides. The strategy of double binding. This has won ASEAN a reputation of, as a bridge between great powers. Unfortunately, GPC is burning the bridge. Valencia 20, ASEAN members are under mounting pressure to choose between the U.S. and China. The U.S. sees an opportunity to co opt these states with dem- diplomatic full court press that could split ASEAN. Countries' proximity to China make them reluctant to openly confront it, even with U.S. backing. As a result, cohesion is withering away. Louis 21, with GPC, ASEAN is struggling to maintain relevance in the regional architecture. M- many lateral groupings, such as AUKUS and the Quad, should serve as a wake up call for ASEAN. It shows signs of a Relevance. The alternative is better. Saha 20, 21, ASEAN led regionalism neither excludes the U.S. nor supports Chinese hegemony. It treats both as partners. The answer, the answer is not for the GPC. ASEAN is key to curb food insecurity. Mazetta 17, by accelerating trade, creating food reserves, and the facilitating, facilitating flow of staples from surplus states to shortage ones, transnational threats to food security make regional cooperation essential. Due to rapid urbanization and demographic pressures, countries will face supply problems. The key factor for regional food security remains the political wealth of ASEAN. Absent action, conflict erupts. Hennigan 15, World War III is imminent, instigated by food civil wars and terror could be the results of food crises that begin as early as 2030, particularly in places like East Asia countries may go over war uh, over increasingly scarce supply. These wars escalate. Crypt 19 with resources and undergrowing stress. Nothing can be ruled out. Nuclear conflict remains a distinct possibility in South Asia. Stress in food and access to nuclear materials is multiplying food insecurity is the precondition for use of nukes. Contention for is pandemics. GBC hinders sign of scientific collaboration. Throw at 20. China and the U.S. have engaged in an all confrontation room. GPC called politicians in the U.S. to introduce proposals that aim at China, or curbing China's influence in U.S. science and research. Chinese pilot, science is not Chinese politics. COVID-19 was the first in a series of global tragedies if the U.S. major uh, major scientific actors failed to collaborate. Indeed, Wu 20, China and the U.S. are well-placed to lead infectious emerging disease preparedness from national interest research and global health perspective. Recrimination will make it difficult to prevent future pandemics before the outbreak. The U.S. withdrew its expert at the China CDC. An outbreak anywhere can become a pandemic everywhere. A safe operating space can only be provided through international co-op. Pre-GPC cooperation was fruitful. Lee 18, the U.S. worked closely with China China until 2017 held meetings to report on collaborations, including China Field Epidemiology Program and the Tuberculosis Prevention Project. These played a crucial role in response to emerging infectious diseases and global health security. Action is key. Plump 21. The next one could be worse than COVID 19. The infectious diseases have emerged with alarming regularity. By scientific measures, the world was lucky. Luck is not a strategy. Though the next viral outbreak can't be prevented, the next pandemic can. The alternative is undercut. But whoa, who 20? The death toll associated with, associated with COVID was 14.9 million and fuels conflicts. Is the key 21. The relationship between pandemics and wars as long as history. Pandemics weaken societies and exacerbate civil and interstate conflict. Like COVID-19 will redefine nuclear alliances, doctrines and policies. The state might use a pandemic as cover for provocations, increasing the risk of nuclear conflict. That's been engaged. The first question. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Let's talk about your sub point. Uh, I think it's your contention too about uh, that the U.S. props up like autocratic leaders, right? Yeah. How much is the U- U.S. actually sending these countries, right? Because you never read evidence that they're propping them up specifically. You just say that they send some margin. Oh, yeah. We say we're give we're propping up countries like Erdogan and Turkey, like. Bong so, bong markets in the Philippines, and in Saudi them. Arabia, all of which are like despotic dictators. So if the U.S. wasn't sending like Turkey money, would Turkey suddenly collapse and become a democratic state? No, the point is that we're not supporting them. Like the the argument isn't necessarily that these countries would like magically stop being autocracies without great power competition. The point of the argument is saying that a we stop supporting them, which gives Russia and China a way to say like, hey, the U.S. is hypocritical, and B, and more importantly. The alternative to supporting these allies is supporting like flourishing democracies like NATO, Japan, South Korea, et cetera. Who but that doesn't make any sense instead, because in the, in the status quo, right, in order to combat Russia and China, which is literally what NATO is designed to do, we're giving more of our money to NATO. Wouldn't you argue that in a world like without the GPC, right, where the U.S. doesn't have an incentive to invest in NATO, they wouldn't invest at all. The only reason we're investing in democratic countries is as a bulwark to Russia and China. Again, that's our first contention. No, but the point is that 
yes, we're investing in democratic countries to an extent, but it's not to the extent that's necessary to prevent global democratic backsliding, which is only done through the Koenig evidence. When we have an alternative great power competition that actually prioritizes democracy. I'm gonna take a question. Sure. Um, your Pakistan scenario, mm -hmm. is your scenario that like the terrorists will like break into the delivery vans and get the nukes? Yeah, there are two links here. Number one, it's just that overall tensions rise enough for there to be a war. And we would argue that the one way this could happen is through nuclear terrorism. Our yeah. argument is even dependent on like nuclear terrorism actually happening. As long as like an, a terrorist from India who's like angry at Pakistan is able to like break into a nuclear weapon, we'd say that's enough provocation, even if it's never launched, to actually cause war, which would be really bad. But can I ask okay. a question? Yeah. So on your last like sub point, you say that pandemics are like causing war. Can you name a single war that the COVID pandemic caused? Um, war in Yemen, it caused Saudi Arabia to lash up further there. It caused like pretty directly the war in Ukraine because Russia had like diversionary pressures because of economic so, issues at home. Those are two examples. I think the pandemic the war in Ukraine wouldn't have happened. Yeah, probably not. I mean, pretty much all of Putin's invasions have been like politically motivated in times of economic troubles. Like 2014 oil prices fell, invaded Crimea, 2008 global recession, invaded Georgia, et cetera. Here, you can get a question. Um, let's talk about your argument about Latin America. I love democracy. To. Mm -hmm. Our countries in Latin, is Mexico like a flourishing democracy? In the status quo? Yeah. Not necessarily. Like Guatemala. Why? Which countries in Latin America are democracies? I mean, we'd argue even if they're not flourishing democracies, insofar as the US is sending some money to help prop up democracy, as per your own contention, that should be a good thing. We would argue um, saying, oh, not everything in like Latin America is perfect, so we should just not send any money that helps prop up democratic regimes is a pretty bad viewpoint. Okay, think... really quick, we both agree that democracy is good and prevents war, right? Sure, yeah. Okay, cool. Starting an overview, a world absent GPC would be net worse. Mazar 19 explains that U.S. leadership is good. In fact, Kagan 22 writes, billions have been lifted out of poverty and democracy has spread to over 100 nations. There has been no recurrence of world wars. Moreover, the alternative is worse. Kagan 22 writes, if the U.S. abandons GPC, China and Russia will gain power. This link turns all of the net conflict scenarios. Cohen 13 writes, a world in which the U.S. abrogates its leadership will be a world in which China sets the rules of politics and trade, causing mayhem and chaos in the Middle East, prefer stopping authoritarian regimes from gaining power. Going to the first contention about Iran. Turn it. U.S. presence increases emboldenment. Rui 20 writes, Washington maxim maximum of security campaign against Iran has pushed each side into a series of escalatory moves and counter moves to the Iranian government. U.S. pressure could potentially become an existential threat to its survival. That's why Degridis 20 writes, little would do more for de-escalation than removing U.S. forces from Iran's reach. You can wait on magnitude here. War to Vox confirms U.S.-Iran war would likely lead to hundreds of thousands deaths. For trying to forcibly remove the country's leadership might drive that total into the millions. Moreover, Jonas 18 writes, the Iran's nuclear sites are spread across the country, heavily fortified and protected with missile defense. Thus, Israel lacks the capacity to carry out a successful first strike. Then, Piper 18 writes that neither side actually wants to go to war, and Israel is relying on current political circumstances to collapse the Iranian G. But moreover, war is more unlikely than ever. Carlin 19 states, state conflicts that threaten U.S. interests have been replaced by substrate threats. Other regions have taken on more importance. Thus, he concludes, thanks to U.S. efforts, the chances of war are lower than any time in the past 50 years. But moreover, on this link about a drawing, there's no great power involvement in the Middle East war. Every external actor will limit damage from regional instability rather than get involved. Seven over 16. In, in contrast to the early 21st century, the crisis in the 2010s developed when the role and leverage of major powers external to the Middle East as meddlers or security guarantors declined. There's also no scenario for drawing Glazer 17. External powers gaining a stronghold is Plausible. Russia suffers from economic problems. China lacks political will, and no state in the region possesses the ne necessary capabilities. All right, let's go on to the second contention about authoritarianism. First, turn it. GPC has increased democratization. Two reasons. A. Myers 21 explains U.S. democracy programs focus on a variety of initiatives, including providing capacity building and training for local activists and groups, including developing cooperative networks and expanding funding for high capacity NGOs. Moreover, the U.S. was a linchpin for the creation of the U.N., NATO, the Quad, and countless other security agreements. All of these have made incredible strides in tackling authoritarianism. Way on probability. In a 13-year-long analysis, Lawson 19 found USA democracy and governance aid has a significant positive impact on democracy while all other variables were statistically insignificant. But then we would tell you the numbers they talk about are also largely distorted. FH21 explains there are two main reasons for this backside in democracy. A is President Trump, especially him not conceding to the 2020 election. The U.S. is hurting democracy because other countries see the U.S. setting a bad president, not because of GPC, but because of Trump. Second, is COVID-19 as repressive regimes work to reduce transparency, promoting false or misleading information, crackdown on the sharing of unfavorable data or critical views. He quantifies there were declines across 36 countries linked to the health crisis. Moreover, their impact doesn't make a lot of sense. They give you no quantification as to how much the U.S. is giving in aid, nor how much is actually helping these dictatorships. And so as that's true, you don't know how much this huge impact they talk about is actually from GPC. Additionally, all the dictatorships that don't get U.S. aid have the biggest population, like Russia and China, don't give them any access to this insane number. 
All right, let's go to the C theory about Aishan. First, Wartel finds that the US strategy of great power competition is what created Aishan. Even if you buy that Aishan is facing struggles in the status quo, Aishan wouldn't even exist without the app. Already, we're winning on a prereq. But moreover, their own evidence says they're under pressure to choose between US and China. It doesn't say they're actually doing. Then their evidence says that Aishan would fall apart from two years ago, but none of their impacts have occurred. Clearly, the organization is functioning fine in the status quo. But moreover, the impact evidence is purely hypothetical. It's not quantified, and it doesn't tell you why any of our opponents' links actually matter. But then they don't give you an impact to you why either picking the United States or China is a net benefit. We'd say that insofar as they can't prove that, they don't get linked to their or, uh, to their impacts. Let's go into pandemics. First, Turner, great power competition actually helps the response to pandemics. Sanger 20 explains the race for vaccines came about because of great power competition. This race got us vaccines considerably quicker as Ron 22 finds that specifically competition with China causes to fund Operation Warp Suit. Critically, WAPS 22 finds that vaccines saved an additional 20 million deaths in just one year. But moreover, on the impacts, you don't know when or how severe the next pandemic is going to be. It's a really bad voter. In addition, they give you no quantification as to how much cooperation is going to increase and how much of that cooperation is going to help the effectiveness of dealing with pandemics. Then you can outweigh on a short time frame. The last big pandemic happened a century ago. In 100 years, we'll probably have the necessary materials to deal with pandemics. Then pandemics happen irrespective of their argument. Their evidence only says that cooperation allows us to innovate in disease control. That means the impact triggers, regardless of how good we're able to recover from a pandemic that's already started. But the conflict link is really silly. They say that Ukraine or Yemen wouldn't have happened without pandemics, but these conflicts have been brewing for so long, they don't get access to their impacts. Vote. Bear overview misunderstands GBC. The capitalization of GBC in the resolution and inclusion of the word strategy imply debating the peculiarities of the current approach, which was crafted in 2017. U.S. leadership is not the debate. It is not a referendum on that. The Mazar evidence and Kagan evidence are just examples of why the U.S. should be a leader. But our entire case is that GBC is harming U.S. leadership. Second, they say Russia and China are the alternative, but they've conceded the current evidence. And we would harness allies like NATO, South Korea, Japan, Australia, which the evidence concludes Russia and China should be afraid of. They have not answered this and have just read a billion paraphrased pieces of evidence, which are incredibly unspecific to our case. On Iran, they uh, uh, will concede the defense that there is no risk of war in the Middle East. Their only other turn is that. Uh, we emboldened them, but since there was no war when we were in the Middle East, and U.S. presence in the region checks risk of emboldenment because although they might get mad and angry, they will the U.S. would always leave them if they started a war on authoritarianism. Group the two reasons they've increased democracy. They've conceded that the U.S. is responsible for 36 percent of backsliding, but only five percent of increases. Second of all, although we were once promoting democracy, i.e., via creating the U.N., NATO, and Quad, we are no longer doing so because the Breen's evidence is only one specific to GPC and says that GPC is actively contributing to, uh, to funding of an autocratic regime where we do anything to get our way. Although we're focusing on a variety of initiatives, the efficacy of those initiatives. To could come to the top of your head. What are they doing? They say a 13 year long analysis. GPC hasn't existed for 13 years, and that's about US aid, which isn't the center point of US democracy promotion. They say that they're distorted because of Trump, but our Fisher evidence is before Trump and says that democracy was still backsliding due to GPC. And then they say that COVID 19 worsened oppression. If COVID 19 worsened oppression, that proves that pandemics worsen authoritarianism, meaning winning our contention for it's a prerequisite to a large part of the raft. But second of all, although it does worsen it, it's only a factor. There are still other things that overwhelm. They say the impact makes no sense. But we say that they're responsible for 36% of backsliding and that any risk is bad because it contributes to a whole litany of impacts on Asia. On first, the Wartel evidence is literally worthy of them losing the round. It says the exact opposite. It doesn't mention the words great power competition. It says the US withdrawing from the region is what created Aishan. It is the exact opposite of what they're claiming they're saying. Um, second of all, they're, they say that we, they, it doesn't say that they are choosing. That's precisely the problem. They are stuck between choices, which creates gridlock. They say that Aishan would fall apart from two years ago. That's only one piece of evidence. So the evidence from now says that Aishan is unable to do anything. They say there's no net benefit from picking. The evidence literally says that the harm is that if they don't pick, the oh, organization doesn't work on pandemics. They say it helps, but we don't need vaccines if we detect pandemics in the early stages. That's that's the evidence we write in our case. Second of all, the vaccine distribution and development was bad. If we work with China, we are better, are better able to uh, solve the pandemic. The next few responses are just mitigatory, even saying who, what, when, where, why. But we have isolated the pandemic story coming with we're, we're, we're alarming regularity and, kill, and can kill millions of people. Let's go to their case. On India and Pakistan, one relief won't solve, but 22. The solution to money only kicks the can down the run. Pakistan's elite do not pay taxes. Government keeps the exchange rate artificially inflated. Pakistan's well-being can't rest on geopolitical alliances. Two, CPAC, the vehicle for Chinese investment, according to their app, is blameless. Leroy's 21. Islamabad is the seventh largest beneficiary of Chinese funding abroad. Many social networks have improved as a result of CPAC, with jobs being created, and this is emerging day after day. Three, turn. Even if investment is bad, GPC is the architect. And, uh, Leroy's 21. In Afghanistan, with the withdrawal of American troops, the Chinese are willing to invest a large sum, uh, a large amount into the Indo-Pakistani route. Where 21 for this when the US is prepared with, to withdraw from Afghanistan, the urgency of refocusing on great power competition was a leading justification for investment investment can't be displaced the rush 21 despite pre washington narratives for Islamabad trying to get closer to the west is no longer a viable option the only possible impact with current blood operations is to, is with the business community cut the card there um then i'll read the impact defense there is no pakistan nuke terror hashimi 12 pakistan has a robust control system weapons kept as unassembled and dispersed with multi-layered security these are, these are extremely complex challenges and impossible for terrorists to uh to cross uh, on nuclear spending one turn overstretch layers in 22 great power competitions vague definition laws anything under its label a containment doctrine was used to justify interventions around the world from uh coups to wars the worst crimes of the cold war this is what great power competition threats to do again having the United States into overstretching itself, trying to counter every action by major powers. A second proliferation turn, 2D20. Great power competition prevents America from playing constructive role in international arms control withdrawal from international treaties, military budget rates, and nuclear arsenal modernization have caused great concern. Um, 
prefer means 21. You grow worse potential has been so high in area 80 years. Lack of, lack of US capability could lead to aggressive military miscalculation on Africa. One, we competed before GBC for soft power carrying 22 in the last second alone. The US launched the Power Africa Blue Dot Network and enhancing global development and growth through energy initiative. Two decades are minimal. Zim 20. The talk about heavy indebtedness to China has been overblown. Cut the card there. But lastly, the impact is very, very bad. It's not statistics. It's their own map. The all the data is pre-GBC and see the impact of aid is not the time. Same type of assistance outlined in their link up. Strike it from their foe. On Latin America, the serious CSI evidence says what the US should do and says the US is not doing it right now. It is incredibly power tagged. Ideally, GBC could be good, but their evidence absolutely does not say that's how the US is approaching Latin America. We have consistently sprung up despotic leaders since the Cold War. All of our evidence on our case proves that to be true. So touching on your C3 about Aishan, uh, in response to our ward cell card, you say that this is the exact opposite of great power competition. What did we do in 2018 as per your definition? What did we do in the Middle East in 2018? Uh, withdrew. Right. And our ward cell card tells you that because we withdrew, Aishan was created. How is this the opposite of great power competition? Mm, no, no. Like, OK, so first of all, the ward cell evidence is from 1996. Uh, and, and second of all, like, it doesn't talk about great power competition like at all like i know i know you paraphrased great power competition in there and it was like three lines long but the wartel oh, evidence is... says nothing about great power competition right okay this is no our wartel evidence is specifically about just us pulling out creating regional alliances. okay so then i have a question if it's just about you pulling out why did you tag it as great power competition let me see the card our, that, it, seems like, that seems like pretty unethical. Like if we had not looked at the evidence, we would have assumed that it does talk about great power. Like to claim that something is linked to the topic only for your evidence, not to mention the words related in the topic is a pretty big jump. No, because the analysis that we make is because of great power competition, we're able to pull out of regions. And then the Wartself card pairs with that. And we say that because we pull out of regions, we created things like Aishan historically. Is that what you said, though? Like, I, I think on the doc, quote, Wartzell finds that the U.S.'s strategy of great power competition is what created Aishan. It seems like you're citing Wartzell to indicate that GPC created Aishan. No, our, I'm, I mean, I didn't put it in the doc, but I... Yeah, yes, yes, you did. Like, that's why I'm reading off the oh, doc. No, I didn't put the actual analysis in the doc, but yeah, that's that's kind of what we're going to be going yeah. for. Well, this seems like a weird way of, of squirreling out of, like, you all just lying about evidence, but yeah, you can have a question. You, oh, okay. Uh, let's talk about, hmm. you say, you say on this response we make on authoritarianism about our Lawson card that U.S. like aid is not a fundamental facet of democracy promotion. So then in what ways are we like competing for democracy in these countries? So what is our main facet of democracy? By propping up autocratic regimes. So yeah, that's that's what we say in our case. That's the Breen's evidence. I think it's really good. Explicit to create power competition. Um, and says that we are propping up regimes left, right, and center because it gets us closer to Russia and China. We don't condemn their actions because it gets us closer to Russia and China. No, no, no. You say sp this is specifically that we say that. Oh, democratic aid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think aid is the entire like, um, like what like. There's only so much aid you can do. Like sending what food, water, well, assistance, what else do we supplies. Do? You need you need institutional change in governments. And what's right. more, like what's more, what has more of an impact on a government than aid is the institutional support. Like aid is an institutional support. Okay, so what institutional support. support do we give? Because you say that aid isn't a fundamental facet of great power competition, and that's why you should throw out our evidence. Okay, so then, I think one. Are I think one. You need to prove that aid is a facet of great power competition. I don't think you ever did that. Um, okay. se second of all, um, the more the bigger thing is number one, condemning the actions of the government. And second of all, providing funding to the government, not to the people, aid is to the people. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Good cross. Um, I'm gonna start uh, on the top with the turns they give you, and then I'll go to our case and their case. Way in the middle. Start on the turns on our first contention. They say that GPC causes China to invest in Islamabad. We'll concede to the defense that there's not going to be a war in Pakistan anyway. On top would be about nuclear spending. They give you a Turk that nukes are overstretched right now, but no, our evidence finds they've averted large scale conflict for years. That's why none of our allies are proliferating. Then they give you a turn that prolif is bad because it causes miscalculation. But our Henning and card says we specifically secure our nuclear arsenal because of the GPC that reduces miscalculation across the board. Let's look to where we're winning the round. It's our argument about African assistance. It's really simple. US GPC investment counters Chinese spending in Africa, preventing debt traps that destroy these countries economies. Thankfully, our new influence has resulted in $31 billion being sent to the region, well over what's needed to save 20 million lives, cut HIV and malaria deaths by 64%, and strengthen overall health systems. They read two really unpersuasive responses here. First, they say we competed for soft power in Africa before GBC. They don't read a card, but it doesn't even matter. Our evidence finds that specifically the only reason we invest in this continent is to combat China. They've conceded that on that, our investment in the region goes up under a GPC framework. Additionally, they tell you the impact is terrible, but again, even if you don't buy our very clear evidence that we specifically sent $31 billion to strengthen 
in health systems. Obviously, some amount of aid is better than no aid. We're still winning here. This outweighs their arguments about conflicts in authoritarian states and wars being spurred by pandemics for a couple of reasons. First of all, trade prevents war because it forces our economy to be more war reliant on other countries. Lee 20 finds an increase in bilateral trade, interdependence, and global trade integration significantly promotes peace between countries. Building strong sub saharan economies prevents those countries from falling into conflict, preventing many new instances of the wars that our opponents talk about, but also investing in the economy, invest in our green tech, which is evidenced by an Inflation Reduction Act, which has invested hundreds of billion dollars into the green tech industry, reducing emissions by 40% already. Climate change comes first because it affects everyone and increases resource wars. Now, let's go on to the overview. A world without the GPC is net worse. Mazar 2019 explains that U.S. leadership is good. In fact, Kagan 22 writes, billions have been lifted out of poverty and democracy is spread to over 100 nations. There have been no recurrences of the world wars our opponents talk about. The alternative is worse. Kagan 22 writes, if the U.S. abandons GPC, China and Russia will gain power. They literally concede this. It turns all neg conflict scenarios. Cohen 13 writes, a world in which the U.S. abrogates its leadership is a world in which China sets the rules of politics and trade, causing mayhem and chaos in the Middle East, destroying vaccine rollouts, destroying democratization because it's an authoritarian country. Obviously, you prefer the U.S. being the hegemon because it's a democracy. They try to say the resolution is about the benefits of the strategy of GPC itself, but you're still voting for us here. Again, we'd argue a benefit of our strategy is that it prevents China and Russia from getting global hegemony, which kills millions. But let's look under their authoritarian contention. Again, GPC has increased democratization for two reasons. First of all, Myers 21 writes that U.S. democracy program first focused on a variety of initiatives, which involves building democracies all across the globe. But second of all, remember a Latin America argument, which says that specifically a part of GPC is to help democracy. They say that USAID is in a fundamental facet of GPC. That's fine. They consider a Myers card that says democracy program focus on capacity and building in these countries. Again, uh, it has nothing to do with GPC. But they're on the, hey, Sean, uh, their own evidence says they're only doing it under pressure to choose between US and China. It doesn't mean they'd actually do it. All of their impact evidence is hypothetical. It doesn't make any sense. They never tell you Aishan isn't functioning in the status quo. The only evidence that it could have fallen apart is from two years ago on pandemics. Pandemics happen irrespective of their argument. Again, their evidence only say cooperation allows us to innovate in disease control. That means the impact triggers regardless of how good we are. But again, they've conceded that the conflict link is really silly. They say Ukraine or Yemen would have happened without pandemics. These conflicts have been brewing for so, so long. They have no actual impacts here. We'd say it's always an ass ballot. Our case there, case starting on the democracy argument. Actually, starting on the overview, because they, they extended that. Cool. They extend the overview through Inc. Number one, they've conceded and misunderstand GPC and the peculiarities of the approach. It's a specific 2017 doctrine implemented under the Trump administration, not just general Cold War strategy. Two, our entire case is about how GPC specifically harms U.S. leadership. And three, they've conceded we'd still be able to use things like Japan, South Korea, et cetera, or democratic allies instead of um, their argument, which, which means we turn this overview on democracy. They've conceded democracy is collapsing all over the world because U.S. allies are experiencing the burn of the decline. GPC is at fault by overemphasizing competition with Russia and China. Our current strategy justifies promoting authoritarian leaders, let's say, sided with their opposition, which they've conceded to lead to global authoritarianism around the entire world. They give a few responses. The first is all causes, but one, they've agreed that we still promote leadership regardless. Our entire case is, is a reason it's bad for hedge. Two, they've conceded to a cranny evidence that the alternative cooperating with our close allies, which means we also, we turn the app, group the turns, one, the guise of democracy is used to promote authoritarianism. All their evidence is pre-2017, but we say that um, they've conceded that, that we're responsible for 36% of the decline, even if it's increasing 5%, we are way on scope. And they've also conceded that we're no longer doing so. Post-2017, the FXC is going down. Here's the reason this outweighs their argument about economic growth. One, authoritarianism means that authoritarian leaders don't need to give aid to their people. For example, Maduro's blocking aid in Venezuela because um, it, it, he's not accountable to the population. Two, it causes civil wars through repressions around the entire world outweighing on scope. And lastly, it affects the entire world, literally 73 countries more than Africa. Go to pandemics. They've conceded the, they, their first response is that pandemics happen either way. This is precisely their argument. They're going to happen either way, but the only way we can actually solve for this through cooperation. But they've conceded the link that because we antagonized China through great power competition, we're not able to cooperate on things like the field epidemiology program, which was used during SARS, which means that pandemics are going to be happening around the entire world. Their only other response is that innovation happens. No argument isn't about innovation. Irrespective of how much innovation happens, we would still be able to detect the outbreak, which they've conceded means we can't stop a massive amount of pandemics that are going to be happening imminently, which means that, um, uh, yeah, links into the weighing. Um, here's the Wang. A, it outweighs a magnitude killing hundreds of millions and disrupts trade around the entire world um, through things like shutdowns. On their Wang, they say trade solves war. Trade doesn't solve war. Claire 22, you can't trade a war. This argument is killing. It's not, a, not big enough to fully explain the piece. The effect of small benefits of trade in the US China was just 1.2% of GDP, which means it's not enough. Um, and the new uh, on their climate change wing, it's made up. They didn't read an impact of climate change. They say war will happen resource scarcity. That is not anywhere near a war. And the New York Times signed that it, it'll only reduce emissions 0.1%. And um, we didn't pass it because of GPC. We passed it to reduce inflation on their case. On nuclear spending, extend the term that GPC is insanely vague and there's overstretch. They say there's no proliferation, but the argument isn't about proliferation. It's that conventional wars are used to justify coups and wars around the entire world, like fighting in Syria, Libya, and Ukraine, which is a bigger link into war on scope and links into all the wing from before. Um, on the BRI, 
the extent of the response that we competed before GBC. They say we don't read a card. Yes, we do. It's the Kenny evidence is in the doc, the Blue Dot Initiative and the Power Africa Initiative, which means there's always a profit invested uh, incentive of two investors, which means we always will do so. Also, um, they've also conceded that their impact is literally made up. It's bad. It's their own math. Um, and also extend their response that debt traps are minimal. He says it's scalar, but the point is that they won't default either world, which means their economic growth is going to be fine, and they have literally zero link into any offense in the round. Can I get the first question? Yeah. So let's talk about your argument about democratization. Let's look at like Turkey specifically. What has the U.S.'s aid to Turkey actually done? Like, what have they been able to do with it? It's not about aid. That's uniquely bad in Turkey. It's one, we just refuse to condemn Erdogan for literally anything he does. Right. After uh, the detention of Uyghur Muslims and he sent them back to China, everyone was okay with that. The U.S. has provided active support to Erdogan and he's been able to maintain power. Oh. And since then, Turkey has become it's more... Like, so you just quote, like, everyone was okay with Erdogan. Doesn't that mean in either world, even if we buy every part of your argument, every country except for the U.S. is still not going to condemn him? No, will... no, because the chronic okay. evidence, but this is where the chronic evidence is so, it fits so, like, fits so perfectly into our narrative. It says that we harness allies like, an, and Turkey's part of NATO. We can use NATO to condemn Turkey for its actions. And we harness the allies to combat authoritarian regimes. Uh, can we get a question? Sure. Okay. Um, so you say that trade reduces conflicts. Can you give me an example of that happening? Well, no, because those conflicts haven't occurred, but we can tell you that logic. What about the conflicts that have occurred? Like trade was high prior to World War II. Why didn't that cause, like, why didn't that prevent it? I mean, we would tell you only after World War II did the U.S.'s strategy of great power competition actually like begin to go into effect, right? But we're talking about trade generally here, right? Yeah, so like, prior trade, to World War II, trade, trade was high. They're happening right now. And like logically, right, if two countries are trading a lot, they're probably not like going to be at least marginally less likely to go to war, which is better. Yeah. We would argue World War II was caused because of like Hitler, who obviously if you're killing like six million people, like the trade with that country doesn't matter as a reason not to go to war with them. And he was also like invading other countries. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Can I get the question? Yeah. All right. Let's look back to pandemics, right? Mm -hmm. So your argument isn't about stopping a pandemic before it starts, right? It is. Like it's about early detection. Like uh, cool. so surveillance of the pandemics and diseases. So containing pandemics and the, before they become pandemics, keeping them epidemics. Okay. So sure. So why didn't, like, why would the next pandemic start specifically in China or in the U.S., That's which is the only two places it's where you're going to actually happen? happen? It's, so A, like, we would be able to co it and solve the current pandemic, and two, it doesn't matter. Like, the point is that, like, regardless of where the pandemic occurs, we're able to cooperate with yeah. all the other biggest global yeah. health so, superpower to stop it. So the China Field Epidemiology Program, which is an example of what was, ha how was happening until 2017, that is not just in China. That includes stations in Africa as well. I'm a, but clearly that didn't work, right? Because even when because China of great power competition, pandemic started. Pandemic started during great power competition. I, mean, I would argue it's just such a nebulous claim to say that oh, suddenly like one bit of cooperation is going to stop pandemics worldwide forever, right? Like, how, what does that actually look like? I don't think it's stopping pandemics worldwide forever, but putting a significant dent in them that would save millions of lives. Also, I don't think you're like if you're going to climb an argument, it's not going to climb yours. Like, I don't think like the investment in the economy in Africa is going to lead to climate change initiatives, which will stop yeah. resource wars. Is a particularly persuasive argument, right? Like, just I make mean, the war. Sure, cool. cool. That's cross. It's going to start on the turn, then the overview, then our case, weighing their case. Everyone good. Start on the turn on our C2. They say that prolif is bad and it causes U.S. miscalculation. Our Hennigan card that says we secure our nuclear arsenal, which reduces miscalculation. They also say that conventional war is bad. That's our argument. Conventional war decreases when you put more money into nuclear weapons. At the end of the day, your ballot should prefer a world in which the U.S., a democratic country, keeps China and Russia, which are aggressive authoritarian countries at bay. Extend the overview. A world absent GPC would be net worse. The alternative is worse. Kagan 22 writes, if the U.S. abandoned GPC, China and Russia will gain power. This link turns all their scenarios. Co Cohen 13 writes, a world in which the U.S. abrogates its leadership is a world in which China sets the rules of the game. Prefer stopping authoritarian regimes from gaining power. That means you don't see cooperation on pandemics or on Asia without the GPC because China still wants hegemony. They try to say the resolution is about the benefits of the strategy, but you're still voting for us here. We argue that a benefit of our strategy, which has existed since the Cold War, is that it prevents Russia and China from gaining global hegemony, which our host card rights would kill millions. They say that the GPC harms US leadership, but remember, prefer the US combating China and Russia authoritarianism in the first place would happen to leave the world. Look to where we're running around African assistance, US GPC investment counters Chinese spending in Africa, preventing debt traps. Thankfully, new influence resulted in $31 billion, well over what's needed. 
to save 20 million lives? There were two responses. A, they say that we competed in soft power in Africa. That doesn't matter. Our evidence specifically finds the only reason we invest is to combat China. They've conceded that on net our investment goes up. But second, they say the impact is bad. Even if you don't buy our evidence that we send $31 billion to the region, obviously some amount of aid is better than no aid. Let's go to the weighing. First on magnitude. Our evidence finds that USA has saved 20 million lives, which is A, more than more people than some marginal amount of US military assistance than a culture, country like Turkey is killed. But moreover, more people have died in the coronavirus pandemic. But look to their case. It's really silly. They give you an unpersuasive argument on authoritarianism. Extend the turn. They say that uh, GPC has increased democratization. Myers 21 explains US democracy programs focus on a variety of niches. They say that USA is in a fundamental facet of GPC. That's fine. They've conceded Myers that says we focus on capacity building. Then they say that democracy was backsliding before Trump. That means their case is in top goal. It concedes that this backsliding was before GPC in 2016. Go to pandemics. Ishan extends in Grand Cross that they stop pandemics before it happens. However, Will concedes in summary that pandemics happen irrespective of their argument. Make them pick one if you're going to sign your ballot for it. They've conceded that the likelihood of other actors stepping in domestically greatly increases over time. Moreover, they haven't extended the conflict link. It's going to be a really clear out ballot. Okay, uh, we're out. Go nag af, starting with the overview. Anybody not ready? Okay. First thing I'm going to deal with is the overview. There are some major inconsistencies. In summary, they agreed we're talking about the 2017 strategy because number one, the capitalization of great power competition indicates doctrinally defined. And second of all, it describes strategy, which hasn't existed since the Cold War. At that point, it's our current approach. Even then, they've agreed that our entire case is a turn. It says that US is bad for the GBC is bad for US leadership and hegemony. Second of all, Cronin conceded throughout the entire round. The alternative isn't letting Russia and China trample over us. It's harnessing our alliances like NATO, like Japan, South Korea, Australia, which our evidence says China and Russia should be afraid of. It's better to combat authoritarianism. They say prefer solving authoritarianism over all else. Uh, over all else. Also have proved authoritarianism is the most important argument in the round. Go to the argument now. Their only response is that we're doing capacity building. This is our entire argument. The guise of democratic promotion allows the U.S. to actually support autocracies. We have read the Fisher's evidence saying 5% of increases are due to the U.S., but 36% of backsliding is due to the U.S. We constantly prop up dictatorships in Latin America, Africa, etc., throughout the globe, Turkey, the Philippines, Saudi Arabia, all of which have been magnified under GPC according to the Breen's evidence because our goal is simply to get closer to Russia and China. They have conceded that democracy Democracy is a unique impact filter. It solves nearly every single crisis, makes terrorism, war, famine, poverty, all less, which the U.S. is upending. Filter this through the claim that democracy is declining now and the U.S. is not being able to solve it, but has the ability to through the chronic evidence. They have dropped all of the weighing. Their nebulous increases in economic growth do not matter if there are authoritarian regimes because it never trickles down to the people. Second of all, they create things like conflicts and civil wars, et cetera, which breeds the necessity for aid. But second of all, they're only about Africa. We're talking about a slide in 73 countries that massively outweighs on scope. We're definitely winning a risk, and that risk definitely outweighs their case. On the app. First, on the Africa argument itself, they've conceded we've done things through the Blue Dot Initiative and the Energy Power in a Africa Initiative to promote soft power and done it before GPC, given the 2017 definition. Make them isolate and increase. Second of all, they straight up agreed that they are doing debater math and that their evidence does not say 20 million lives have been saved. That's their own analysis. Treat their impact with heavy skepticism. They say they outweigh on magnitude, but no, because our argument turns the link into theirs. It dramatically reduces trade and interaction between states, meaning any risk of African economic growth does not outweigh any risk of an authoritarian slide occurring because of great power competition, which pretty much every scholar agrees given that our evidence is far better. Good round. Good round. Good round. Thanks for judging. Thank you guys for judging.